So we're going to move on down to inner trochanteric hip fractures now. In the last two uh, talks we discussed femoral head fractures, femoral neck fractures, hip dislocations, and we talked a lot about osteonecrosis and non-union. Fortunately, neither of those are that much of a problem when you get to the inner trochanteric region. Now you're talking about a place uh, that's extracapsular, uh, there's going to be good blood supply, there's good opportunity for callus formation, um, and uh, these typically can be fixed with uh, compressive forces without too much difficulty. Um, so uh, a couple of ways to think about this, Cert certainly stable versus unstable intertrochs is a nice way to think about it. Um, you should be aware of AO classification, certainly when you read papers this is what's going to come up a lot. Um, 31A1 is a two-part fracture uh, without comminution. Um, so what you would consider a stable intertrochanteric fracture. Okay, and when we say the fracture doesn't enter the lateral cortex, it means like this uh, uh, lateral wall here. Okay, so this area here is not breached, which is very important actually. Okay, and you have to sometimes look critically at your x-rays to make sure that this is truly the case. And if you have very externally rotated film, you may not be able to tell. 31A2 is the same two-part fracture with a um, lesser trochanteric fracture. So this fracture is considered more unstable. Okay, your calcar potentially is disrupted, or at the very least, your uh, you know, post-remedial cortex at the lesser trochanter is involved. Um, still can be fixed with uh, compressive forces, as I'll show, uh, but this is more of an unstable inner trochanteric fracture. Another unstable pattern is this so-called reverse obliquity, right, or a um, uh, 31A3 fracture in the AO classification. Um, by reverse obliquity, what I mean is that uh, in, the, in the last picture you can see the obliquity uh, comes this way, right, and when you fix these, the compressive forces you know, are directed this way. Um, with the reverse obliquity, uh, you can see the obliquity is now this way, right? So um, it's not really, uh, you know, intertrochanteric the way you think about it, like greater trochanter to lesser trochanter. It starts in the intertrochanteric region, but it almost extends into the subtrochanteric region. And sometimes these can be, you know, more of a short oblique that comes that come this way. But the point is that you cannot fix them with some type of compressive force up into here. It's not going to do anything, okay? unstable. Very important concept with uh, inner trochanteric hip fractures is the concept of tip apex distance. Okay, and what you see here is you see a guide wire in the femoral head and you see x-ray views, an AP and a lateral. It's very important to know what, this, you see this pin here, you see like the, the shaft of the pin ends here, the tip is there and then these threads. You should know with whatever implant you're using, sorry about that, what is that distance, okay? If you know in real life that that distance is, let's just say, 10 millimeters, then you should be able to estimate, because we really, most of us don't have, you know, software on our C-arm, unless you're using some type of navigation maybe, but most of the time you, you're, you're, you're estimating this distance in the operating room. If you know this as a known quantity, then you often can make pretty good assessments of what your tip apex distance is. So know what that is, and then you can know what this is. And what we want it is less than 25 millimeters. Okay, when it, when when the combined tip apex distance of, you know, the being from the uh, apex on the lateral and being from the apex on the AP, when that combined is greater than 25 millimeters, you're more likely to cut out. Right, the femoral your your lag screw is more likely to cut out of the femoral head. So you want to get it as center center as possible. Okay, um, and this was done by uh, Dr. Baumgartner and. Uh, I think it's a very commonly used uh, parameter uh, that's uh, been proven time and again. So implant options for intertrochanteric fractures certainly include the compression uh, hip screw and side plate, something like this shown here. It has controlled, you know, imagine if the fracture is, you know, somewhere here. This is a very externally rotated view, but you can see this is going to compress this very nicely. Also remember that 
you know, with the stable intertrochanteric fracture, that lateral lateral uh, cortex should be intact. Okay, and that's where the sliding hip screw will work nicely. Um, when you have uh, a higher angle, there's a greater tendency for for compression, meaning that um, if you have a 150 degree side plate, which let's just say this one is, let's say that's 150 degrees, okay, you know, it's more vertical, so there's more likely to be, you know, compression up and down. If you have something that's 135 degrees, let's say something like this, okay, so this is going to be a smaller angle, 135, you're going to have uh, less compression Okay, but it also allows you to get the, 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 the screw sometimes more center on the femoral head. And you'll, you'll see this intraoperatively. Um, so there's a little bit of a, of a trade-off. 135 degrees is found to be the, probably the most common uh, type that gets you uh, easier into the center of the femoral head, but still allows good compression. And of course, if you, if you were to imagine if you put a, a sliding hip screw that was like at 90 degrees, I mean, you're going to get no compression, right? Okay. So another option is the intramedullary sliding hip screw. Okay, so here you can see a similar similar idea. You get compression across the fracture, but instead of a plate on the outside, you have a rod that goes down. Right. So similar concept, uh, because the rod is closer to the center of the bone, it's potentially you know the less of a lever arm. Right. If the plate is out here. You know the lever arm is a little bit longer. If the the, the fixation is here, you're you're more center in the in, in the bone, and uh, perhaps there's some biomechanical advantage in there. It's not been shown that this is dramatically better uh, for stable intertrochanteric fractures. And study after study uh, has continued to look at this, uh, but uh, the sliding hip screw still uh, for stable fractures is uh, just as good as um, or better than any uh, intramedullary devices, um, but intramedullary device is far more versatile. Okay, so it can treat a fracture that extends down the shaft. It can treat a fracture that has reverse obliquity, okay, where the sliding hip screw is not biomechanically advantageous at all. Um, and if there is a lateral wall fracture that you can't recognize, um, you'd rather have a, an intramedullary rod in there uh, uh, than a plate. So let's just go back here. If you had a lateral wall disruption here. Let's say that you know your main fracture line was here, but there's also a fracture that is here. Okay? Well that means that this whole segment, okay, that means that this whole segment can potentially slide this way because it's not being buttressed up here. Okay, so if you do have a lateral wall fracture somewhere here and you're using a sliding hip screw, well now you have to add an extension plate, which th they do exist. It's sort of a little plate that goes on top of this plate um, to control this from coming down, okay? Um, or you just use a nail. So a lot of people say, well, why do I have to like go in there and then I'm not sure and if I didn't see something, I mean, you just, I just put a nail in and I can do it percutaneously and um, it takes care of all those fracture problems. Good point. Can't argue with that. Uh, other than the fact that uh, it is a more expensive device, uh, it does get into the abductors. If you ever have to come back and do a total joint on that patient, uh, much harder to revise. Um, and even though it's percutaneous, the blood loss is hidden. It's not like they're not bleeding. Um, replacement options uh, exist as well. Um, some feel perhaps a calcar replacing prosthesis is necessary when you do a total hip for intertrochanteric fractures. Others feel it's not that necessary, but uh, certainly total hip can be done for these, but is rarely indicated. Maybe in bad pathologic fractures, severe, severe bone uh, or comminution, rheumatoid patients, and um, it's just a more complicated procedure than if you're doing it for a femoral neck fracture because you've got disruption oftentimes where you need to seat the prosthesis. Failed uh, fixation uh, can be to screw cutout um, or potentially screw barrel disengagement. Um, what I mean by that is that uh, you know if the sc screw uh, ends uh, like here and then falls out this way, um, that can lose fixation. That's pretty uncommon. I mean, I would hope that uh, 
you know your lag screw you know at least extends uh, to where it's you know out here and um, in those cases it's most likely not going to travel all the way through the rod or plate and then out um, it's cut out though does happen okay and this is where your tip apex distance if you have uh, deep center center position of that screw in the femoral head hopefully you can avoid that because that's a disaster when you get that okay so uh, I think those are just some of the key points I wanted you to know about uh, intertrochanteric hip fractures uh, I hope um, that uh, is helpful for you thank you